Hello there, Andrew Jobling, the accidental author, and I'm very excited to, I'm always excited. I've got to come up with a new word for excited, enthusiastic, um, uh, exuberant, exuberant. Let's go with exuberant this time because I am speaking with the wonderful Stacey Kopas and she's an inspiration. And so you're going to get an enormous amount out of this conversation. Just to give you a little bit before I introduce you to Stacey, she is an author. She's a speaker, she's a facilitator, she's a coach, and she has written a book called How to Be Resilient, and we're going to talk a bit about that. We're going to talk about lots of cool stuff, so Stacey, wonderful to have you here. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to an exuberant chat with you today, Andrew. It will, it will be. There's no other way to do it. Exuberant, enthusiastic, passionate, purposeful, whatever we want to call it, that's what it is. So, but again, I really appreciate your time, and I know that the people watching this who are all, they're either have written a book, they're writing a book, they're wanting to write a book, they're at certain, they're trying to get published, they're trying to sell it, they're at different varying stages of the journey and I know that this conversation with you is going to really help them. Excellent. Yeah, look, I think I've done things a little bit differently so hopefully I'll be able to give um, some different angles and some different perspective to the process. Yes, I know you will. Before we get into that, though, you wrote a book about how to be resilient and you are the queen of resilience. You know, your story is incredible. So why don't we just start, if, if you wouldn't mind, just we spend a few minutes just talking about how you, what was it that I guess thrust this, um, this what is the, what's the best way to say it? Thrust this need for you to be resilient and brought out this resilience within you. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, I think what's interesting, and I think with a lot of us, is like resilience was never a word I'd actually used, um, which was really quite funny um, in, in, in hindsight. Um, but how it came about for me is that uh, when I was 12 years old, um, I was calling off in a relative's backyard swimming pool with my younger brother who was 10 and a couple other boys uh, around the same age and it was somewhere that was super familiar to me and and being the only girl and that bit older and didn't want anything to do with the boys so I just did what I did every time I visited this relative's pool and I kept climbing up onto the edge and diving in and it was an above ground pool so definitely not built for diving but it was just something that I did um, and it was you know didn't go unnoticed I was getting yelled at to stop but I'm sure, you know, we all can remember how bulletproof and invincible we were. We were 12. We do that at 12, right? Oh, my God, yeah. Like, it's like, meh, nothing, nothing's going to happen here. Um, and, yes, yeah, so I just kept doing it over and over again. And then there was just one particular time I was standing there and I was thinking, I was standing on the edge thinking, I feel like I'm splashing too much as I'm diving in. So I stood there for a moment and I thought, how can I make a perfect dive without splashing? So what I thought I could do is I thought if I tried to keep my feet together and hold my legs straight, I thought in theory that would be a nice clean entry into the pool. So I, I took a deep breath and I did exactly that. And it felt like any other dive that I'd done before until I went to try and swim up to the surface and I realised I couldn't move. So I, I didn't feel any pain. It didn't feel like anything had gone wrong. It was just I literally could not move. So panic set in very quickly I was holding my holding my breath thinking how can I get the attention of my brother which I couldn't do um, and so I held my breath for as long as I could but then when I couldn't hold it any longer I had to give in and as I gave in and my lungs filled with water I blacked out and eventually my brother realized something was wrong the you know the, the kids just thought I was mucking around um, so they didn't really think anything of it until I you know I didn't come back up for a, a period of time so they raised the alarm for help and um, and got me like yeah, got me out of the pool. Ambulance ended up going through a series of three hospitals in that afternoon, and it was at the third hospital, you know, late at night in intensive care that a doctor came and told me that I'd actually broken my neck and drowned, and I'd never walk again. So like it literally felt like a death sentence to me, um, because prior to that, um, I was an athlete. You know, I played softball as a pitcher in the softball team in summer and then I was, you know, one of the first two girls to ever play soccer for my school. This is like 30 years ago now. Um, you know, and I was I represented my school at every distance as a runner from every distance from the 100 right through to the cross country. And, you know, academically I was, you know, I was incredibly gifted and 
Um, all I wanted to do with my life was to be a vet and I'd just gotten into, you know, a selective agricultural college for my secondary schooling. So everything was well on track. Um, and then in that moment, it's like all of those things that I identified with and I was working towards were gone. Um, so, you know, definitely that, you know, completely turned my life upside down. And, yeah, as I said, I literally felt like my life was over at that point in time. Wow. Wow. So, so you, you did you dive in head? You dived in head first because I'm trying to visualize. That yeah, well, I dived in like with with the arms, like you would do. You, you um, hit the you hit the bottom, but you didn't. You can't remember that. No, no. So the only only way I know where I'd hit is apparently I had a bruise just above my right eyebrow. So and obviously with trying to keep straight, I had literally gone straight down, and I'd. Um, hit like my forehead on the bottom of the pool and it was the impact of that that just forced my head back and it was all it did was pinch two bones two vertebrae in the neck together and pinched a little bit of the spinal cord wow so so yeah here you are now 12 years old you're told you'll never walk again how did you cope how did you move through that to a point now where i mean you're obviously you love your life you're making a difference you know you've obviously come to terms with um, Obviously not that long ago that you were 12, probably only 10 years or so, obviously, that you were 12, but you've come to terms with this. Tell us how that, how did you negotiate that? Oh, look, it was, it was obviously it was an incredibly challenging time and, um, you know, for the first eight weeks I was flat on my back with the sandbag either side of my head. Like I literally couldn't scratch my head or anything. So, you know, that was, that was challenging in itself and, um, you know, going from being that fiercely independent, active young woman to being stuck in that situation so look I had a lot of time to think at that time um and you know a lot of it was you know I was bitter and angry and you know resentful about how I couldn't do the things I I used to do and um yeah and so a lot of that was um that's it anger anger towards myself was a pretty big one um and it was, it was, there was some of the things there where it was like, I was like, no, I'm never going to play sport again. Can't do it like I used to. So I, I made some pretty strong you know, decisions and pacts with myself at that point in time. Um, and so I had to go through, you know, quite a lot of therapy and stuff like that, physical therapy. Um, you know, I spent seven months in hospital and then, you know, sort of three days after leaving hospital, I was, you know, thrown into a high school in the middle of the year at a school far from home where I didn't know a single soul. Um, so, you know, it was pretty hellish at that time. And through those sort of the, the few years that followed, obviously they were the, they were the most challenging. And I, I, much like a lot of teenagers, I sort of sought some pretty destructive ways to deal with how I was feeling about life and myself and spent a great deal of those years drunk and stoned. Um, they were my, I look at it now as moments of artificial happiness. Mm. Um, but, you know, I look at that time I hated life, hated myself. Um, but I did everything I could to keep up the facade that everything's good, getting on with life, nothing to see here. Um, and, yeah, so that was, that was, you know, that were really dark years. And for those first few years, I would have given anything to I have not taken that dive or to just not be here at all, um, I, you know, it's that, at the lowest points. Um, so sort of thankfully, as I got towards the end of um, the end of high school, sort of I, I, I left those sort of more destructive habits behind, um, and definitely started to you know, to look a little bit more optimistically towards the future. But you know, it wasn't until I was in my twenties that I that the big shift came for me, and that was being able to realizing that I couldn't change what had happened, but I could change the way I looked at it and how I felt about it, and I could change what I did next. And so then I began to look at what happened um, with complete gratitude. And I was like, I am so grateful wow. that I'm grateful that this has happened. And most people think, how the heck can you end up feeling positive and grateful about having your life changed in that way and, you know, needing a wheelchair for the rest of your life? Um, but people see when they spend time with me that I'm, you know, I'm genu genuinely, you know, really happy with about how it's changed my life and, you know, I can say with absolute certainty that I've had the opportunity to do things that I would never have had. What are you most grateful life. for, Stacey? What are you most grateful for? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that, um, you know, I don't take anything for granted. You know, I, I'm, I'm in a position where I, I, you know, I feel that I'm probably more present in every day um, and that now I've ended up having this whole, look, just say yes and figure it out attitude. 
It's like not like, oh, well, I'm going to do this in 10 years' time or I'm going to do this in 20 years' time or having that attitude of, oh, when, when this happens, then I'll be happy or when this happens, then this will be great. Um, you know, it's just being grateful in every moment um, and realising that um, that adversity is, a, is, is an incredible gift and the best growth and the best learning and the best, um, you know, I think the best experiences and the evolutions that we experience um, cannot, I don't believe they can happen without challenge. That's so true. So true. Wow. Awesome stuff. So, Stacey, tell us a little bit about now where you got to the point where you decided you want to write a book. Oh, look, it was, it, was, it was not something that I'd really consciously decided that was going to be in my path. Um, a lot of the stuff that's happened um, that's got me to where I am, particularly uh, I know as a speaker and an author, is, um, has been working with coaches and mentors, um, you know, the people that see something in us and believe in us more than we believe in ourselves at times. Um, so it was through, through um, working with them that um, the book came about. It was also, you know, it was a, it was a mentor that I even put the word resilience to what I do like I would said I, I said it's like it's not a word I'd ever used personally but then when it was put to me it's like oh it's kind of the perfect word to describe what I do um so so I, the the accident itself I had the injury at the end of 1990 um so I'm celebrating the 30 30 30th anniversary this year happy anniversary Thank you. And it is a celebration. Um, so, um, and then the book wasn't even really um, discussed until 2012. So I didn't start even on this journey of sharing my story or putting some structure to what I do, um, you know, until 2011. So it was 2012 working with a mentor um, that, um, yeah, her challenge to me was, first of all, just to, figure out like a framework to how I turn my life around um, with the with the label of resilience. And then the, the, the challenge I had was to do an e-book, just to do an e-book, get it up online um, and then just see if it landed. What were some of your fears around the book before you started? Um, there, was, there was a couple of things for me. I think because I just started speaking, I was just getting comfortable with, sharing my story because at first I I didn't want to talk I didn't want to share my story um, and I had a mentor that said you know Stacey you've got to get over yourself it's not about you because like I thought it's a tall poppy Aussie thing going on um, I thought that everyone would think I was a total wanker for talking about myself <laughs> it's exactly that's, a pretty, what that's a common belief it is absolutely because yeah. you know I, as you know I work with a lot of aspiring authors and a lot of people say the same thing you know well, yeah and who who am i to write this stuff exactly and thankfully i had a mentor that turned around and said this it's stace get over yourself it's not about you it's about your audience and with a story like yours and what you've learned if you don't share it you are selfish i love it like how can you argue with that you can't argue with that yeah, no, and I did. And I'm also writing this down because it's gold. It's yeah. not about you, it's about the audience. Yeah. Yeah, and if you don't, if you don't share your what you've learned, you know, it's not just out there. It's not just going out there and just talking about yourself. There's got to be takeaways. There's got to be lessons in it that you can then impart on people. But obviously, using storytelling as the way of doing that. It's, it's a story. Your story tell, and this is the thing. It is what you did. There's the lesson right there. You know, you don't even need to go here. The ten steps to be resilient, because as you said, resilient was never a word for you. It was just something that was inbuilt in you, and it's inbuilt in every one of us. We've got it in us. It just needs the right conditions for it to come out, and and for you that your circumstances brought that out. And so and that's why I love. You know, your story is so amazing. It's your story. No one else has got your story. I love that. And and the way you've negotiated things. That's that's where the lessons are, which is amazing. So, yeah, I think the other, the other, the other thing for me is I never saw myself as a writer. I'd always said I hate writing. I'd like to the point where through my teens, I, I, I deliberately chose subjects where I didn't have to write. Like even though I was, I was like I was actually a really talented writer, but I hated it. Um, and so what I had to do was then I had to. It was an identity shift that I had to work on in order 
to then be an author. I had to see myself as a writer. I had to stop telling that story that I hate writing. Yeah. So I had to, there was a lot of work I had to yeah. do in order to get to the point where I'm like, okay, I can write. I'm enjoying writing. I've got something that's useful to say. And then once I put the ebook out and I just put that down as a free download um, just to see what it would, you know, what the response was like. And I started getting emails from people that had said, I print out, I printed the whole thing out and I read a section of it every morning. And I was like, awesome. There you go. There's your validation, right? Yeah. And so then you decided to, to get that out there in hard copy and you've done something that's a little bit unique and I think it's really interesting how you went about getting it published. Do you want to sort of share that with us, Stacey? Yeah, because I, I think that's the thing is, is that a lot of the time it's like we, we might get a bit excited that we're onto something because we've got all of these downloads. But really, I think I've been taught in business, then really you really don't have anything until people put money to it. And so what came about for me, um, I was living in Adelaide at the time and there was, um, you know, a, a, a guy in Adelaide that had actually started a crowdfunding platform for authors. So there's lots of crowdfunding platforms, but it was a very specific one. Um, so I was, I'd been in touch with him. He'd run like a little workshop thing and I didn't get to the workshop, but I had a Skype with him um, and he really encouraged me just to, you know, to have a, have a, put it out there and have a go at it. And so there was two reasons that I, I decided to do that, even though I hadn't finished writing the book. The first reason was the proof of concept. It's like, okay, if people put money to this, then I definitely know that they are genuinely interested and it's, a, and it's, an, um, it's something that they're willing to invest in. So I thought, okay, that's my first thing. The second reason I crowdfunded is because I thought it would be great accountability because if I've got all of these people that have already bought the book, yeah then I have, I have a pressure, um, an external pressure to deliver um, on that. So that's why I did the crowdfund to start with. Awesome. So what tells about the process of the crowdfunding? Because I think, you know, there might be people watching this that are really interested. How do you, what do you do? How does it work? Yeah, so what I, what I needed to do in order to be able to actually set up the, you know, a crowdfund is all I needed was I needed a cover a cover design for the book and I just needed like a, you know, basically a blurb and then just a little bit like I did a video talking about, you know, the book and why the book. Um, and so it was, it, there wasn't a lot that I needed, but basically people just needed to be able to get a sense of, you know, what the book was about, you know, if it was for them and a little bit about me. So there wasn't an awful lot that I had to do. But the process of actually just getting the cover done was, was really good. And I was fortunate that the, the person that um, had that platform connected me with an amazing um, designer in Adelaide, then it also connected me with a fantastic um, PR person. So I ended up doing a PR campaign while I was crowdfunding. Um, and I also had that cover design done. And I think once I had that cover design done, it just made it so real because I'd got like a mock-up cover, you know, done on Fiverr for the ebook, you know, the year before or a couple of years earlier. Um, but having that cover was, 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 it just made it feel so real. Um, so, yeah, so, and then the PR campaign was great because then I was able to test like through media, again, is this a message that people are interested in? Um, and it absolutely was. Um, you know, through that PR campaign, I even ended up getting um an opinion piece in the Sydney Morning Herald print about resilience. So I'm like, okay, this is definitely something that there's interest in. Um, and, you know, did some like radio and things like that. And so that was, that was really good. And, but it also, there was, there was a lot of lessons that came out of the crowdfund as well. Um, you know, so if I was to do it again, like I have, I know so much more than what I know net, that I knew at the time. Um, but it was also really exciting to just see, get other people excited about what you were doing as well. Yeah, awesome. They they really feel like they were part of something. Absolutely. Absolutely, which is awesome. So so tell me now, and I'd love to talk more about this with you, but we just don't have the time to do that. We will do a podcast though. So you are going to be a guest on my podcast, the Wellness Puzzle Podcast. We will have more time to really dig into some stuff. But tell me, Stacey, and tell the people watching what 
how's how's things changed for you since you've been an author? You know, how's having a book really helped you get your message out and and do the things that you do now? Oh, look, I've I found it as it has opened up so many doors, um, and for me, I, I went into I went into being an author for very strategic reasons. It wasn't that you know I always felt that I needed I had a book in me and I needed to get it out. Um, for me, I'd gone in there going. For me, I saw it as a as a business card uh, as such, um, and I also saw that as a speaker, you know, if if there was um, you know someone deciding who they were going to book, and it's like, and then you've got one person that's actually got a book, a tangible book, and someone that doesn't, or someone that's had the PR. And it's been in the you know been in high profile media and hadn't, so they were the they were the two they were the things. Also, it then gave me a tool that I could then package as a speaker. Um, so I was able to um, you know rather than just get a, a fee for speaking, I could then offer a couple of packages. And and often I do that, and I'll I might have a room of two hundred and fifty people, and they will buy a copy of the book. Obviously, I do it at a discount. Um, but there's something special about knowing that, yeah, okay, you go and speak to someone for an hour, but then when they take the book home with them, then, you know, that's that's very different. Um, it was the type of thing I think from the business, you know, from a business card perspective, you know, I would go and meet someone that I'd met on LinkedIn and then, you know, after, you know, you, you know you'd send them, you know, give them a copy to, to take um, and then you would hear, oh, okay, I read it on the plane or I did whatever. Um, and it's definitely led to, definitely led to more speaking engagements and um, consulting and stuff like that. So, and there's also just that, you know, there's that prestige around it, isn't it? It's like totally. people just see you're an author. Like it's people are, wow. They treat you differently, right? They, treat they do treat you differently. Rightly or wrongly, that's just the way it is. It is. So pretty much most of the things that you're told about that um, are true. And, and I think but it's, but it's getting your expectations right and about why you're doing it. You know, are you doing it because you think you're going to make a lot of money off selling a book? Are you doing it because it's the, the, the doorway for you to then build other business? But um, it's definitely been fun. Yeah, that's amazing. Stacey, it's been so wonderful to chat to you and I really appreciate your time and everything you've shared. So let's, um, if people want to contact you, you know, maybe they want to find out a bit more about crowdfunding or they want to find out more about what you do, buy your book. How do they go about doing that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I welcome anyone to get in touch through LinkedIn or Instagram is probably the two best places. Um, also, I actually manage all of my own online media. So if someone sends a message, they are going to get me, not not my VA or anything like that. Um, and I, I got, I'm I'm literally an open book as far as things go and I really enjoy the process of being able to answer people's questions and give them that, that you know, that leg up that other people gave me as well. And you've got a website? Yeah, stacycopas.com. Um, and if people are interested in having a, a look at the book and how I've sort of put that together, um, there's actually a free download of the ebook version at howtoberesilient.com.au. Wonderful. Okay. Well, that was exuberant. There's no doubt about it. That was an exuberant conversation, and I really appreciate your time. It's, you know, you're doing incredible things. You are the epitome of resilience, but you're way more than that. You're way more than a word. You are incredible. So keep up the great work, Stacey, and look forward to having a further conversation with you on the podcast. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Andrew.